Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, this is the Nest Egg. Uh, in the Nest Egg, we are uh, we will be discussing various financial planning topics. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is for education only and not investment advice. Um, our goal with this webcat with this web webinar is to provide some, you know, great stories and um, information on financial planning to help you and your families build and sustain wealth. Um, so, in our recent, um, also let me introduce myself. I'm Gloria Park. I'm one of the financial advisors at Nest Financial. I also have Dan Diller joining me. He's one of the senior financial planners uh, at Nest Financial as well. And so we're we are your hosts for today. Um, in this up in this past uh, Nest Egg web Nest Egg newsletter, um, I had a we had put some topics on there that we saw common throughout our financial planning clients. And so we thought, you know, it would be um, really great talking points. Um, I'm sure if they're experiencing, you know, having these questions, um, others might have it as well. And so three topics, main topics we'll be covering widely is uh, insurance um, within a, a company benefits, also retirement accounts and company stock options. And so, um, so Dan, you know, we, we recently had this, um, we recently had a, uh, a client, um, that we met with who had a lot of questions regarding life insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, they have some insurance through their company. And what we found is that they had about, I think through the end of our analysis, you had recommended for them to end about 80 or 90% of their insurance coverage. Can you go more into detail as to why that happened? Yeah, for sure. I'll give some more details around it. So a lot of times when I, we see clients um, and insurance is one of the topics of financial planning. So we want to make sure we're covered. The, the main thing that we want to make sure is that there's appropriate coverage when it comes to insurance because some people don't have enough. And then some people have too much. And so it's this it's this sweet spot of having what insurance is designed to do. So it's, there's a lot of education that goes around, what are we trying to accomplish with insurance? So the first thing that we do is we ask the questions like, what, what's the, what are the goals? Because insurance serves different purposes uh, for different people. It can be as, uh, for the most common thing that people do have insurance for, though, is covering any liabilities that, may happen if one of the spouses were to pass away. And so you want, the idea is you want for there to be an easier path for surviving spouse to get to retirement and retire. Because if you think about this from a um, perspective of life, uh, life longevity and, and, and partnerships, a couple gets married typically early in life and, and they're working towards something. And usually it's this, Lots of things come, uh, as you know, I mean, new house and kids and all of these things and all of these things can bring liabilities. Uh, so which we've seen, right, Gloria? So it's one of those things that um, liabilities build up. So earlier in life, when people come out of college and they've got maybe school debt, maybe they've got a, they bought a house, maybe they've got a couple of kids, all that is a liability. So if to something was to happen to one of the partners uh, during the early stages of, of, of that uh, marriage, then it could be very detrimental financially for the surviving spouse and the family going forward. So for the most part, we try to prevent that. That's the red flag that we're trying to prevent. And most of the time when people buy insurance, that's the purpose. So going back to this case that we saw uh, recently, um, there was just a lot of insurance on, you know, to be had and, 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 or that the client had or has, uh, unless they've already let it go. Um, and their, their thought process was exactly that. It was, we want to make sure that my surviving spouse doesn't have any liabilities. They get to retirement. So what people sometimes don't take into consideration is what retirement is going to cost and what those costs are. So it's, uh, insurance usually comes in increments of, 100,000, 200,000, 100,000 levels. So you just go buy some. And a lot of times not doing a financial plan, you don't understand what is it that I need. I know how much debt I have. 
So that's easy to start with. But how much will I need in retirement? Once we figure that number out, we can determine, you know, what would take a person into retirement and cover personal retirement. So um, in this in this particular case, in this particular story, um, the clients were already close to retirement. So debt was gone down. So once again, let's go back to the young couple. Young couple has a lot of liability. Throughout the next 10 or 20 years, they start paying down that liability. And, and at the same time, they start increasing their assets. And so at some point, there's going to be a crossover where they have their net worth is higher than their, obviously their net worth is, is they have negative net worth to begin with, but then it's going to be a positive net worth at some point. So your insurance changes throughout your life as well. You might need a higher balance insurance to begin with. But then as you get close to retirement, you might have your assets that are up here and your liabilities down here. So there's no need for that insurance. And so in this particular case, that's what happened is that they had their assets built up and the insurance there was really not serving a purpose of protection anymore it, because they were being protected by their assets. Mm. So anyway, that's, I, I know I spoke a lot. Feel free to interject and ask me other questions as long, along the way. Cause I don't want to be the, you know, just, just talking about this, but it's, it's, that's the, that's the, 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 the idea. Sure. And um, if any of the, if anyone in the audience have any questions, we do have a chat box available there on the side. So please feel free to enter them in. Um, on another case, Dan, um, well, on several cases, we often see people that are working, you know, a regular nine to five job and they have um, insurance provided by their companies. Mm -hmm. I've often heard, you know, and they feel like, oh, this is enough coverage for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to cover X amount of my salaries or it's just an X amount of dollars. So in case anything happens, I'll go to my family. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that you've often suggested to these, to our clients to get a policy outside of work. Um, and why, why is that significant? You know, why should they even care about getting even more insurance when their company's paying for it? Well, that makes Already. a lot of sense. There makes a lot of sense. And I, you know, I want to just chat about my beliefs in company benefits. Uh, so company benefits themselves, there's certain things that I think should be attached as a benefit to an employment. You know, if you think about employers back in the day and employment back in the day versus today, um, during, you know, the industrial revolution, industrial age, it was all factory workers and, and employers really wanted to keep employees on for life. And so they offered kinds of pensions, they offered insurance, they offered all, they just tied everything they could to the job so that people didn't have to worry about anything once they retire. Well, as the information age came available and, or came, um, so if we've transferred from information into information age, companies are structured differently. And, and a, a person, a person that has uh, a job, might 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 the average changes of job is now like six times. So it's no longer this long in term employment with one company. So some benefits I think are important, like, you know, 401k. And we'll talk about that. Retirement savings, I think, are important. I think that's that's important to still tie to a job. When it comes to life insurance and health insurance, these are things that that one should consider. Uh, obviously, health insurance is the group discount rate. It makes sense to have it as a as an employer. But when it comes to life insurance, I've never thought of tying life insurance to your job. The reason is that your health changes and to qualify for insurance, you've got to be in some, some type of good health to get a good insurance rate. If you were to change jobs six times throughout your career and during the time that your last employment to the new employment, you, you know, had some sort of health issue. Now you're new, you may not be able to get new coverage or if you get laid off and the new job opportunity doesn't have insurance, then you're going to have to go seek insurance on your own. And with health problems, it'll be much, much more difficult. So I always uh, advise to get your own life insurance, your own policy that you own, just like your own homeowner's owner's insurance and your auto insurance. You don't tie those to your job. Tie the, just They're individually, they're yours. They're not, nothing else is tied to it. And you can do it when you're, 
you're younger and you're healthier and you get a good rate and you get a longer policy. Um, and then whenever the job offers you uh, insurance, consider that gravy. A lot of times they'll offer one year term uh, policy for free. And so that might be a $50,000 term that they give you. But if you've already got your half a million dollar or a million dollar policy that's your own and they give you a $50,000 one, gravy, cool. If you happen to be still working for that company when you pass away, then your family benefits from it. But don't take the chance of that having to happen for you to have that. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Totally. So I see a question from uh, the audience. Uh, do I recommend special provision insurance such as accidental death or cancer insurance? So I don't. I, um, I think that when it comes to um, – Especially, let's let's take let's break this up. Let's back up into accidental death versus cancer insurance. If your let's, accidental death first, if you pass away, whether it's an accident or not, or not an accident, the 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 detriment to the family is the same. It's equal most of the time. So, um, and so some of these. I don't know why they came up with this, you know, 200, 300, 400 percent if an accident has happened, because the loss to the family is there's an emotional loss and then there's a financial loss. The financial loss is exactly the same, uh, whether you passed away because you got hit by a car or you passed away of natural causes, heart attack. It's the same, the same detriment. So I, I, I think those are gimmicky if they, you know, if they give them to you at work, great. It's again, it is, it is completely gravy is the way I consider it. It is not what we consider our base foundation plan. Base foundation plan is one thing, gravy is another. When it comes to cancer insurance, you know, your health insurance, if you've done a good job of selecting health insurance, it should cover cancer. I mean, there's there's these limits that you should be max out of pocket in your limits, should cover cancer. There is Usually zero need for additional insurance if your health insurance is, if you've got a, a healthy health insurance. Now, if you've got a um, bare bones health insurance policy, then cancer insurance might make sense. Um, cancer is, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's a big thing. Um, but you just look at your current policies. If, if, it, if the current policy covers it, don't worry about getting extra if you're if you're bare bones, um, high deductible, and you want a cancer insurance, I'd say I'd say that's where I would just look at it a little bit deeper for sure. That br- does bring me to another type of insurance that is tied to work, which is not life. Now we're talking you know, you're more in the health side. Is disability insurance? There is one thing that happens, and we were talking. We've been talking about life insurance all this time, and mm-hmm. some health insurance with this question. Disability is important. However, the risk, and, and with everything throughout life, your risk, um, you know, your risk of life insurance, needing life insurance goes down over time as you build assets. Your risk of becoming disabled, you're more likely to become disabled than to die prematurely. That's that's like a six to one odd, something like that. However, your time of likely becoming disabled is usually also goes, the risk goes down over time. So we're just kind of nutty and learning when we're in our 20s, right? And we take a lot more risks and those things can cause disability, right? Um, Some things obviously are out of your control, but for the most part, the reason that, that we see the numbers work that way is because our own decisions and own experience. As you get, you know, 30, 35, 40, you, you, um, you just become a little bit wiser and more careful about, you know, your things. And so disability, disability also, uh, the risk goes down. So I would say disability is important to look into because the one thing that happens if you become disabled or, you know, you've got social security that can help, help protect sometimes. And so you got some work insurance that gives you some disability, but make sure it covers the debt because the last thing you want to do is be disabled and, and you have all this other kinds of insurance, but you don't have enough income to continue to, to, to uh, supply what your needs are. So that's kind of a little bit off topic, but I wanted to like dive into that a little bit. All right. 
Well, <laughs> that was a lot, Dan. Well, but jump I'm, in. I, I but, you know. No, I mean, this is great. I don't want to interrupt you. Like, you just get on this roll and it's like awesome information. And so <laughs> on point with answering the questions and, you know, answering my questions and also, you know, providing extra stuff. So it's been great. Um, you know, you had mentioned when you were talking about insurance, about 401ks and the importance mm -hmm. of saving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have clients who have retired or are in the process of retiring and some people who are just ready to like leave their job and go solo as mm -hmm. in like opening their business or becoming self-employed. So on that note, um, as people, you know, leave their jobs and end their 401k plan, uh, what are some of the options that uh, you usually recommend, you know, and, and where to do with that 401k? Because some yeah. people just leave it there for years, as right. we've seen. Like new right. clients, they're like, oh, I've had this or this money in 401k for like the past 10 years. Right. And you're, we're like, what? So. Well, you know, the thing about finance is, uh, quite frankly, it's really boring and people to like look at things every day. And so it's 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 very easy to mismanage or not pay attention when it comes to your money. And 401ks, a lot of times people are like, oh, I got to go do something with it or I can leave it there. It's just much easier to leave it there. The problem is, and, and here's the, the reality about 401ks. And I want to I talk to everybody about from, from the employer's perspective. The employer is the one that establishes this 401k and establishes the parameters around it. Now, the employer has employees that are young and has employees that are older. Because they're the fiduciary of this plan, it is their responsibility to provide you a plan that is going to benefit the young and the older employee. Now, what that means is whenever they pick choices in their 401k, they've got to give, they've got to give something kind of average. It's not designed specifically for one or the other. It's going to be right in the middle. So many, many 401ks are just really not great options when it comes to leaving your money there. They're great options whenever you're working for the company and the company's contributing to it. And that makes up for some of the lack of luster of choices because you typically only have like 15, 20 choices instead of 401k. And Dan, when you mean choices, you mean like, you know, mutual funds or investments to inside the, choice, in, inside the plan. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, okay. for sure. So. So those choices is what makes your money. It's like when you, it's like when you're picking a, in a horse race. You want to pick the best horses, the strongest horses, the ones that'll get there. You know the same thing uh, when it comes to your investment management. You want to have many, many options. And the way we manage money, obviously, it's it's based on the economy. So you want to have enough options that it gives you like this last year was crazy. We did a lot of treasuries. We did a lot of, of cash. We did some gold commodities. commodities. Mm -hmm. 401ks typically don't have those kind of options. Uh, as many options as, as are needed. So what we recommend is as soon as you leave a job, put it into an IRA. An IRA is an individual retirement account. A 401k and, a, and an IRA are from a tax perspective are exactly the same. You can move one to the other without paying any taxes. It's called a rollover. You do that once, but the uh, the thing about it is now you're moving from 15, 20 options inside of 401k to 50,000 options inside an IRA. You can literally, you can put anything inside, inside an IRA. So now imagine, you know, your ability to um, make your money engine work for you. And think about this as an engine, right? One is like a four cylinder engine working and it does this thing. Nothing wrong with that. It's just, but now you've got, a supercharged car that you can go do stuff with in this other engine. And so that's what you want to be cognizant between the, 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 the 401 ks Once you leave a, a job, always roll that down to an IRA. The only reason to keep it inside a 401k, like let's say you can also move it to your new employer's 401k. And the only reason that I found over all these years is if you plan to borrow against your 401k, the new employer might let you do that. That's the only reason, but you know, you really want to not, you really want to avoid that, that kind of stuff. So, so, um, that's, that is, uh, the advice there as far as what, what to do with it. And obviously, you know, then you have the choices of what to do. Obviously you work with companies like us that do the management for you and we are able to kind of help build something uniquely for you instead of leaving it in an average, you know, little car that 
is not going to get you the mm -hmm. return that you need. I see another question from the yep. audience. Can retirees contribute to 401k IRA? Is there a maximum to contribution? So this is a really great question. A retiree can, there are, so how about the answer is vague, right? Because there is, mm -hmm. there is a way for a retiree to contribute to 401k. Let's, let me break that question up. A 401k is an employer sponsored plan. If a retiree retires from work and then goes and, you know, makes their own business, maybe it's just a part-time business, but they're making income you can establish a 401k for yourself. It's called a solo K. And I know we're going to try to touch on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then you'd roll your 401k or, or you, you could then contribute to a, a 401k. You're, you don't have to make, there's no set amount of money you have to make. So if you got a hobby that you turn into a business, open a 401k, contribute to it, put your money in there, it'll save you money in taxes. If you're not doing a business, yes, you can, you can, um, you can do an you can do an IRA if you have income, earned income. Mm -hmm. So let's say that same scenario: retiree leaves the full time job, and then you know goes off and maybe they're driving Uber, maybe they're doing something that you know part time that just they want to do. That's earned income. You can contribute to an IRA. There are differences in rules. One has an age difference. You can contribute to an IRA until you're 72, and then you can't because that's that that point they require. And we're talking about traditional IRAs. In a 401k, you can contribute as long as you're working. So let's go back and, to this. And same SEP group. IRAs too, Dan. Mm -hmm. Right. This SEP one. IRA, I believe, has has. Uh, I've got to go check the the age on that. I'm not sure what the age on that because it's an IRA, so there might be some mm -hmm. limitations there. But I know the solo 401k. It's an employer plan. In a 401k, you can you can put money in there as long as you work. So let's say you're I'm going to use Uber again, Uber, and you're self-employed and you do a 401k, you can put money into it past the age of 72, all the way to like, you know, let's say you're driving through 75. Hopefully you're not, you know, because things happen as you get older with, with driving for others and things of that nature. But let's just, you, you know what I'm saying. Um, the difference between the both of them, you can do both. It's just a matter of whether you're earning income and whether that's your own income or you're working for someone else, um, how, how that is. And as far as maximum contributions, which is the second part of this question, um, the, the beauty of a solo 401k is that you're the employer establishing the 401k and you're the employee. So the max contribution, if you're over 50, it's like 23,000, something like that. And it's, I, I, they, they, the numbers change every single year. But you're also an employer. The you can do 25% of your income, uh, the company income. So once again, let me let me use this Uber driver example again. You make $100,000 a year because that's what you want to do. You're self-employed. You can put 25% of that, $25,000 into your solo K, plus another $22,000 into the, you can do almost like $50,000 into a solo plan 401k. So that does have a clear benefit if you're trying to make more money while you're retired. In your um, IRAs, you have just the normal, the normal max contribution, um, and I believe that's was that six thousand to five hundred now. Um, it's six thousand under fi age fifty and seven thousand over. 50. Okay, so so yeah. those are those are the those are the limits there. Cool. So that I guess we were going to talk about retirement plans anyway, mm -hmm. and I think I just touched on all the things that we wanted to talk about. So just to recap. Yeah. When you're working for someone else, you have options of 401k. When you in between jobs, you can roll it into an IRA. You can always roll it back into 401k if you if you feel like you want to loan from it. That's an option. But if not, leave it in your IRA because you have so many more options there. If you decide to go into work for yourself, um, and which might also be, let's say you have a big 401k or big IRA, and you want to um, go work for yourself and establish a solo K, you can roll some of that into that, and you can borrow against it if you need to. So there's some benefits there. Mm -hmm. um, solos make a lot of sense for, for employers, self-employed people. You can do that for yourself and for your spouse. Now, the reason that you don't want to, it's not, it's not considered a traditional 401k is because 
there are rules around 401k as far as the employer has to contribute the same amount to everybody. So, and there's, and there's testing and there's all kinds of things. So the solo allows you, if it's just husband and wife in the company, solo allows you to max, you give it 25%. Yes. All this time, all these employers could be putting 25% into everybody's, everybody's 401k, but they don't, they put like three because they just want to give you as a, a benefit, but they can do 25%. But if they do 25% for one, they got to do 25% for others or there's other testing. So um, long story short, solos are very appropriate for husband and wife teams companies because you can put, as I said, up to $50,000 plus dollars into a solo 401k. Once you have one employee, now you start to start offering them that. And so then it changes the, the whole dynamic. So I always advise if you need an employees go part-time with them so that they don't have to they can't qualify for the 401k if this is what you're trying to do uh or offer some other kind of benefit but um that's th those are the unique things about the solo man we're already almost out of time do we cover our last bit yeah one thing i wanted to mention is i believe that if you have a business partner like say 50 50 ownership of the business they can also be a part of this solo plan and their spouse Correct. So you can yeah. contrib yeah. be contributing yeah. like, you know, total of almost 200000 a year, you know, and which yeah. is also tax deferred for the business and hey. the employee. Well, so, well, uh, I'm going oh, to clarify that just, mm -hmm. just um, still when I say partner, when you say partners, it's just, it's top level people. If you want that yes. and if there's no employees, that's great. It's great for those. However, you do have choices. You can build a Roth plan inside your your solo K, so you can do part tax free and part uh, mm -hmm. tax deferred. And there is a big reason to do that, and we can talk about that in another another webinar. But okay. it looks like we're down to out of time here. Do you have one last question, or how are we doing? Well, we yeah, we, well, we started a couple minutes late, so I think we can go a couple minutes over too. Um, the last topic, you know, and this relates to uh, retirement planning. And we've seen this over and over again, is company stock options. I know okay. earlier this year, we, we were meeting with a, um, with a client who, um, unfortunately, you know, I, it, would, it seemed like out of, you know, FOMO, like fear of missing out or just hesitation on paying taxes. But this client, from what I remember, lost a quarter million dollars in value. Of stock options we had one they that held had, for too long we had one that lost a million in in it, that's it, right the, that we had a conversation with and they we didn't do any more work with them we just started had the initial conversation but they had, they had lost a million and and it was this during you know during 2020 when all the tech companies went up and then all of a sudden they you know there's a big loss of value they yeah. lost a million in value and that could be very heartbreaking the thing about stock options it's very individually based when it comes to when you have stock options, you really need to sit down with a planner because every stock option is different. There's ISOs, there's ES, there's there's like five, six different types of uh, stock options. And every one of them can have different consequences when it comes to taxes. Depends on whether they're grants or whether they're given to you or whether you 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 have exercised um, exercised them or not. The general thing about them is you know, if you if you're able to exercise them, uh, wait a year, hold on to them for a year potentially, and then you can have a lower uh, tax. Um, you can have lower taxes because now you're paying long-term capital gains. That's not always the case, and it's not always the best advice to do that. In this case, that's we advised one of our clients that we were working with earlier this year to go ahead and sell, and they weren't having waited for a year, and. They were going to pay the higher tax amount. But the thing about it is we were seeing the economy and we were seeing tech start to take a dive. It was a major pullback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, we thought it was a less risky move to have them pay a little bit higher taxes and recognize a higher value than hang on to that stock. And um, lo and behold, they went ahead and followed our advice. And a few months later, they're like, we're, they're so thankful because they they were able to get out at a high stock price and they paid a little more taxes, but they recognized the value as opposed to this one client that, again, we didn't we didn't bring on as a client. We just had an initial conversation, lost like a million dollars because they were just hanging on too long to this stock option. And will that the, the problem with stock options is 
or one of the issues is you're heavily concentrated in one company. You already work for the company. You already have a retirement company plan with the company, which probably has stock in it, and you have stock options. So you're really heavily weighted. Something happens, it affects, it hits you significantly, and that's what happened to this one individual. And then, of course, the, there's this, well, I work for the company. It's going to come back in this and that. Well, sometimes there's a lot, a lot of other things that are affected. So 2020 was really good for certain kind of companies, but they may not see that valuation for another five, six years. So you've got to be willing to like ride that out and see if that comes back. So there's just uh, not a lot of general advice or general education we can give on stocks without going really into the weeds because they're stock options because without going really into the weeds because they are so different. My main advice is if you've got some of these, you really want to think about the diversification. You really want to think about talking to an advisor and and sharing what you've got and then having a plan of when you're going to make these sales. So, so for some of our clients, we have, you know, this year you'll sell this much, this next year, and we have this this long-term process to diversify them out and make sure that they're they're getting the, the most value out of this option, alternate plan. I think that's one of the most important and valuable things about financial planning, especially with us. And just from working with you, Dan, is that, you know, these people have, they see these huge value of stock options and they have no plan for that money. You know, when we start working with them, they start to realize, well, I can use part of this to fund my my daughter's um, education, or I can do this to remodel the house and their gears start turning, you mm -hmm. know? And so that selling of the options of the stock start to be a, a very, very intentional sale with a goal. And mm -hmm. I really love that, you know, the clients start to discover, you know, what the possibilities and that fear starts to decrease, you know, that right. fear of missing out on these huge gains or whatnot, because you already have a plan, you know, mm -hmm. everything's already set out. So I, I love seeing that when um, we work with clients. So, awesome. um, but it looks like we are out of time and uh, thank you everyone so much for joining. Um, we will have these, um, this webinar recorded and sent out to all the attendees. Uh, if you know of anybody who can benefit from these webinars or just need to chat about finances, you know, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll be really happy to have a chat with them. And so thank you, Dan, for your financial wisdom. And <laughs> okay. uh, I'll see you later. All right, Bye, everyone. You. Bye bye, everyone.